Welcome back to the DuPont Collaboration Series. Moneni, I'm going to come to you because we're going to talk about this 10-year innovation plan that South Africa has. We're, earing, uh, we're edging rather towards that 2018 uh, point, the target point right now. Some of the key grand challenges as outlined in the plan, uh, focusing on the pharmaceutical sector here in South Africa, space science and technology, energy, energy security, uh, climate change, and also an interesting one there, human and social dynamics and the role that uh, science can play in understanding human ev evolution. Um, but bringing, back to, bringing it back to South Africa's success stories, I mean, where do you see South Africa's made the biggest strides when it comes to those grand challenges? Yeah, thanks, Samantha. I think there's a number of areas to look at. When you talk about space science, uh, people will remember that the biggest ever science project in the whole world called the Square Kilometer Array. Uh, it comes to South Africa, and it comes really building on our own realization of the capabilities we have uh, as a country and as a continent. Now, when you talk square kilometer array, there isn't going to be any bigger science program like it is. So that already says we've got a huge success story. Everybody now, globally, when they talk about South Africa science, they're going to talk about square kilometer array. Now, we have also, in various areas, we, when we look at the pharmaceutical side, um, one of the things that we are endowed with in this country is Floor Spa, which actually a, a is an input into the active um, pharmaceutical ingredient in the um, antiretrovirus drugs. And we are now finalizing the partnership which will help us uh, have the company that will manufacture those drugs uh, in our own country. And that really translates into huge savings for our economies because mm -hmm. we're spending quite a huge amount of money on drugs. Uh, mm -hmm. Then the other thing is in the area of, of energy, um, for some reason, God has decided that 80% of the world platinum will be in South Africa. And we want to utilize that. Uh, it is, uh, again, uh, a critical part of when you look at the hydrogen economy. And we've got a huge program uh, on the uh, hydrogen energy, which is really focusing at how, for example, we are going to utilize that. And I assume you, you know, you're talking to the platinum ma major miners here in South Africa. Having spoken to them as well, they, of course, realize the, the opportunity that this presents to them. So how is that collaboration with the private sector working? Well, the collaboration with the private sector is ongoing. And, and when you get into these engagements, uh, as I've mentioned, uh, starting from the SKA, we've got partnership with a number of multinational ICT companies, your, your, your CISCOs, uh, in terms of the uh, data transfer, etc. And when we talk about the um, pharmaceutical ingredient one, our own company in Pelindaba here is also quite involved, but we also have invited um, uh, um, participants from e other multinational, uh, even local um, mm. pharmaceutical companies to partner us in that pro process. So you can't do it alone. And, and this really also touches on the issue that our colleague in Kenya has indicated uh, about the education system. We need the private sector to move forward because the education sector does not move as fast. It's the slowest moving industry. So now if you've got the private sector involved, they deal with the latest, and that, that is really what is really becoming exciting when it comes to SKA. Mm -hmm. Now, um, there was a mention by Rachel a little bit earlier on about the um, titanium powder. Again, one of the areas where we are quite good. The CSR is conducting that research, we're working with the private sector again. It's an area which has got huge interest for the um, aviation industry, especially because it's a tough material, but um, it's very light. Mm. And here, again, we've got interest from uh, global um, uh, companies that are manufacturing uh, airplanes, et cetera, and we're partnering in order to make sure that these endowments that we have, we add knowledge to them and they proceed. So we think we are beginning to make some very interesting strides. Uh, the successes are there, but it doesn't take away that we are actually starting from a low base as a continent, and hence, while other countries outside of this continent are w working at five times the speed, we probably need to make that 20 times or even 30 times. So there are really very interesting signs that um, we <coughs> are on the right track. Challenges, they will be there, but yeah. we'll deal with them head on. 
I mean, when it comes to education, Rachel, this is an area that you were involved in, mm -hmm. being a lecturer yourself uh, to, to young scientists and working in the laboratory. You no longer do that. Mm -hmm. uh, but how do you how do you how do you think about uh, the education model in an innovative way in South Africa? Because we need to make sure that, as you say, the tertiary institutions keep up with what is needed right now, as opposed to what was needed five or ten years years ago. Okay. Uh, so, how would we start thinking innovatively around science education? Okay, so for me, I think this is a conversation that we had earlier on that says, first of all, we've got to get the basics right. Where we have a system that ought to work well in terms of having classrooms that are adequate, having pupils that are well fed come to school, having the teachers that are competent come into the space and spend the relevant contact time uh, delivering knowledge, teaching children on the basics of what they need to know. Then we've got to start thinking about education as it was then. That as it may be the basic. Education as it has been is evolving very, very fast. When we develop for I infrastructure now, as we think about education, what is education looking like now and what is it going to look like in the future? And we start to think about ICT as an integral part of how education is delivered. Delivering uh, new information and learning to children in, and students and learners in remote places and introducing our children to technology in their mm -hmm. very early stages is a way that we ought to be thinking about um, how to educate our people to stimulate curiosity so that they can start to gravitate towards working in the science space because it is about curiosity, wanting to understand how things work and so on. And in fact, if you give gadgets to children, you would be surprised how intuitively they will figure out how those gadgets work. Mm -hmm. And in fact, in the house, you get the youngest people to say, how does this work? They will show you. So for me, trying to introduce technology at a very early age uh, into our education space is key. At the CSIR, we have a program that we work with the Department of Science and Technology and the Department of Basic Education to say, how do we crowd technology into schools? And we're doing this in pilot district areas of uh, an area called Kofimbaba in the Eastern Cape. And we're beginning to see results where we're seeing that where we bring in tablets, carrying a whole curricula for students instead of delivering books and carrying on and Don't have to talk about textbook sagas. Exactly, well, <laughs> let's not go there. Focus on bringing in technology and making it work to deliver value in yeah. terms of how we teach our children. Those are some of the things that are key. We even have in our technology space um, a new technology we're calling the note taker, which is a technology that allows visually impaired people to learn as well. So how can technology, so that is innovation. Instead of using the old braille technology, we're saying where we have tablets and iPads and things like that, how do we innovate around supporting and developing new technologies to enhance education? Mm -hmm. And uh, at the CSR as well, we do support infrastructural development. And as I indicated earlier, it's no longer about norms and standards for infrastructure for basic, basic education. It's about infrastructure that is holistically conceived in a manner that it delivers value in terms of value of learning. Yeah. So. Uh, you, uh, McClay, you, you are president of the International Association of Science Parks, and perhaps this fits into the, the realm of education while we're speaking about it. Uh, so tell us about the rollout of these science parks, where specifically you're focused on, uh, and given the fact that it you know, cost up to $400 million or so to, to build one of these, it's a very yeah. expensive uh, endeavor. How has this been funded? Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Samantha. Let me perhaps uh, you know, pick up from uh, what Rachel was saying, is that we need to look at the entire value chain. And much of uh, the efforts that are being put in into education currently in South Africa and the rest of Africa have been on the higher education side. And we need a long-term investment approach to education. Mm -hmm. We need to take those youngsters uh, from, in essence, age 2 to about 12 and put in a lot of money there because it's a culture, it's a culture that we're changing within the ecosystem. And so the ecosystem will not change by uh, influencing the, the, the upper end. We need to actually influence it from the bottom and invest for the long term. So in 10 years time, those youngsters will be entering in a high school and uh, give them another six years, they'll be at university. And I believe that we'll see a different culture change uh, as Francis has said, we need to be uh, preparing them for, 
not the world of, uh, of a job, but the world of entrepreneurship. And that's where science parks come in. Mm -hmm. So uh, we are a member of the International Association of Science Parks, uh, and uh, with the, uh, a number of science parks coming up in Africa. There's one now in Botswana. There's one in the Eastern Cape uh, that uh, is busy being developed. There's one in the Val University of Technology that got admitted as a full member this year. Mm -hmm. We're working as Innovation Hub with the Abuja uh, Science uh, Park, which is a new park in Nigeria uh, that is also focusing on ICT. There are some in Tunisia. There's been a significant interest in terms of Tanzania in the areas of Science Park. But I think what is also interesting, uh, linking it with the investment that is required to set up a fully fledged science park, are the developments that you see in Kenya, where there are innovation spaces that require less investment, are uh, easily accessible, mm -hmm. uh, have got, uh, and the young people have got as access uh, to uh, free or cheaper bandwidth. And that is a move that the International Association of Science Parks is also you know, making to then start to incorporate incubators and in other areas of innovation so that we create spaces where young people can be able to come uh, or go and experiment with technology. Are they uh, working? I mean, the ones that are set up so far. Absolutely. I mean, they're working. If uh, you, you look at uh, Nairo in Nairobi, the iHub is actually working. If you look at uh, uh, Botswana, Botswana, they're still developing it, but they've also taken a similar approach to how the Innovation Hub was uh, developed in terms of incubating some of the programs. Mm -hmm. So they've got pilot programs uh, running you know, on the side. If you look at uh, Tanzania, there is an incubator that is already being set up by the Ministry of uh, Communication, Science and Technology, and they're focusing on ICT, and in particular looking at how ICT can be able to solve the problems in, agric in, in agriculture. Mm -hmm. uh, let's cross to Carmen in Abuja and get your view, Carmen, on, on the importance of science education. Perhaps you could also touch on STEM education specifically here uh, from, of course, your perspective to Pom's perspective. I think uh, such um, events uh, as the Innovation Summit are very important. Uh, programs such as this one are very critical. We believe at DuPont that we must tell the story we must tell the story of how science has evolved and the difference it has made in our, in our countries and uh, to the human population. We must tell the stories of organizations uh, that have evolved over time about, while sticking to science. At DuPont, we spend about $2 billion annually on R&D, and most of that R&D, about 80%, is targeted towards some of the key challenges that um, Africa faces around food security, around energy, around protecting of, protection of people and the environment. And we need to tell that story. Um, we, we, we need to tell the story of how DuPont started as a gun uh, powder company, went into this stage of chemistry where they developed things like nylon, plastics, Teflon, Kevlar, all these things, and how now we are focused on bio-based materials. And, 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 and through collaboration, which is a big emphasis of DuPont, we want to see how some of that investment dollar that DuPont is making globally can really apply to solving, so it's solving problems at a local uh, level. Mm -hmm. So uh, certainly, science, technology, um, is very, very, uh, education is very, very important uh, for Africa's development. And as I alluded to earlier on, that um, you know, close to 60% of Africa's population is under the age of 25. So our science uh, education has to be targeted towards those li uh, young people so that indeed as they grow up, uh, this science becomes uh, wisdom that they carry. And the, the, the bias towards innovation becomes a culture in the way they do business, in the way they farm, in the way they, 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 they work. They are creative, they are innovative, and they look at themselves as entrepreneurs and not, not just as people who are going to go out there and, and um, work, for, uh, work for someone and be employed. Yeah. Further, at DuPont, we are investing in Africa as well. Uh, we've committed IE to build a $62 million uh, research and development station um, as part of our acquisition of, of, of PANA. And uh, that will be one of only five R&D centers that we have across the globe. Again, here we'll be able to bring in R&D uh, students, uh, postgraduate students, to come and learn how to innovate, how to build solutions 
for the challenges that Africa faces. So it is something that is very important uh, to DuPont. And not only is it important to DuPont, we are taking a proactive stance by, by really telling the story, but also investing locally, uh, targeting the young people so that the future of Africa can or Africa can re realize its true po potential in the future. Mm -hmm. um, Francis, uh, from your perspective, I mean, there's some really interesting stories when it comes to mobile applications that have been developed in Nairobi and Kenya specifically. Um, so from, from your perspective, talk to us about what the government can do uh, to support young entrepreneurs more, to, to enable innovation to take place, to enable the turnaround time when it comes to innovation to be shortened. Uh, and perhaps, because uh, we were talking off air, elaborate on this, using that story of the young man who created that uh, security uh, system and now, now being used, used in Tanzania employing around 60 people. I think the problem we have in this part of the world and including Kenya of course is that there are many efforts which are being you know you know you know you know people are doing a lot of things but in a very unconcerted manner you find all the stakeholders, the academia, the policy makers, the, essentially the government, you know, the industry, they are working discreetly. No one knows what, who is doing what. And I, I want to, uh, to, to appreciate the government of Kenya because through uh, what we call National Commission for Science, Technology and, and, and Innovation, NACOSTI, they are trying to give impetus to the agenda of research and innovation because uh, they are funding young people with great ideas. I, I know they are funding, uh, the Na through National Council of Science and Technology, the government is funding 100 PhDs per year. They are also funding innovators. They are funding women scientists. And they have also other funding you know, uh, they, they offer to, to researchers and innovators. So I think the government is doing a lot of effort, and I, I am very happy about that. But I'm saying it cannot be the government on its side, the academia on its side, the industry on its side. You know, what happens in the developed countries, you find that uh, research and innovation is you know, between the industry and the academia universities very intertwined. You cannot separate them. Actually, it is the industry companies which fund research and innovations. And like in this part of the world where you find the uh, innovators, researchers are doing their own small things and they just do that for publication and it's gathering dust in the libraries. The knowledge therein, no one knows what it is. I, I think uh, we, we must work together uh, you know, uh, uh, in a in concerted manner so that we can, have a, we can mainstream research, innovation, and we have, I would like to see, Samantha, I would like to see an, a national funded by industry, government, and uh, universities uh, uh, incuba incubation center. You know, I want to see this I have this, uh, you know, you know uh, ICT, uh, you know, centers, uh, SME uh, parks, business parks, industrial parks, funded by all, you know, and uh, I want to say, well, in our small way, uh, you know, a bit uh, in, in a very slow pace, we are making progress because uh, it's just last week I had an international conference, International Research and Innovation Conference, and I brought together stakeholders from uh, within Africa and Kenya, and we were discussing how we can do what we do well better and how we can encourage our people to do research, to do innovation, and how they can patent, cooperate, and trademark their innovations. Yeah. Well, having said that, having said that, in my institution, I am very proud because uh, it's a young institution, uh, actually, about uh, six, seven years old, and uh, I am happy of a young man who came through our Enterprise Innovation Development Center. He came up with antibacterial system, just using ICT, actually that uh, if you have a smartphone, a G3 enabled phone, you can see anybody infringing into your house or into your car, you know, antibacterial system, and you can even see actually the actual person, you know, on the, on the phone you have, you can activate, you just press a button and activate an alarm in the house, you know. And this young man is just a diploma young man, you know, just a diploma in, in engineering. He doesn't have to be, uh, to be a degree holder, and I want to say this, you don't have to have a PhD to be an innovator. In fact, you don't have to have uh, a degree to be an innovator, because this young man uh, is now, uh, he's been sought after, actually. He has 
rather a contract because he has registered a company called yeah. Kupata Technologies and he has rather a company, I mean, a, rather a contract with a, a Tanzanian firm worth the millions of money just by doing what he loves just by advancing you know, his innovation. And uh, I'm very happy we have funded him. He has employed 60 people within a very short time. I think uh, the company has been running for less than two years, and he is doing very well. He is doing very well. So I think this is a good example of how innovations, or our young men who have been encouraged to do innovations, can become job creators. And you know, the problem we have in Africa is unemployment, you know? Yeah. We must Francis, move unfortunately, we've come to the end are, of uh, the yes, show, so we're going to have to to wrap it at thank that. You. But I think uh, ending off on that positive note around one of thank the entrepreneurs so that has established so a much. business there, mobile application, and of course, uh, creating 60 jobs with that. So that certainly is a positive uh, development. But thank you all for joining us today. It's been great to have you with us. Thanks, of course, uh, to my guests who've joined me today, uh, Mr. Mbe. Mupe, uh, Mupe, uh, He's the South from the South African Department of Science and Technology. Dr. Rachel Chikwamba, she's from the CSIR. McLean Sabanda, the Innovation Hub. And of course, from our bureau in Abuja, Carmen Moya, DuPont, Sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, of course, that was uh, Dr. Francis Moregi from the Mount Kenya University. Until next time, from myself, Samantha Loring, and my guests, it's goodbye. Mm -hmm.